I am a fisherman. You might be wondering what a fisherman is doing holding a shepherd's staff. I'll get to that in a few moments. But as I said, I'm a fisherman. At least I was before I met him. My father was a fisherman and his father before him. It was all I had ever known. My brother Andrew and I owned our own fishing business on the Sea of Galilee. How I love to fish. I love the feeling of the warm sun on my shoulders, the feeling of standing on the deck of my own boat with the waves rolling beneath me. I love the feeling of freedom in it all. <laughs> freedom. What did I really know about freedom back then? It's funny to think back on how short-sighted and foolish I was. I thought freedom was the ability to make your own choices, to determine your own destiny. How foolish I was. I did not see then, what I see now, that none of us determine our own destiny. None of us really make our own choices. And the only true freedom in this life is to be found in surrender to him. I was born Simon Barjonas, son of John. But you probably know me by a different name, Peter. It means rock, actually more like pebble. But it's the name that he gave me. And as he changed my name, he changed everything else about me. He transformed me. There have been those in the church over the years who have tried to elevate me to a high and lofty status. I suppose there will always be those who choose to do so. But the truth is, they do not understand. For there's nothing special about me. I am in no way unique. I brought no unique or special qualifications to my life with him that in any way qualified me for the work that he chose to do through me. He called me. He equipped me. He transformed me and believed in me. It was all him from start to finish. If I had the time, I would tell you about all of my life with him. I would tell you all about those days. I would tell you about uh, how he taught the crowds. I would have you listen to the helplessness of anybody who tried to trick him, trap him, or question him in open debate. I would have you hear him unpack the prophets to us and how he slowly revealed to us over time who he truly was. I'd have you see his healing power in action so that you would know he was no mere magician or miracle worker. He was compassion, power, truth in the flesh. I would have you see all of this and more if I had the time. But you see, my time is nearly at an end. And it's best that I focus and tell you only about the events that bear directly on how he changed my life. After all, that's the part of the story that I know the best. You, of course, likely know about all the events of that fateful evening that we were together. You know about his arrest and betrayal. You know about that mockery of a trial. You know, too, of his, res his crucifixion and his resurrection and his ascension into glory. But can you imagine for a moment what it must have been like for me, for us, to know none of that? To have no real idea of God's grander scheme and plan as those events were unfolding. If you know him and trust him, it might help you to understand me then by thinking of your own life, what you were like before he opened your eyes and your heart to his truth. I don't offer this as an excuse for my actions, but only as an explanation for why things happened the way they did. You see, although I believed in him, and my love for him was completely unquestioned. My confidence was in me. I was going to be faithful. I was going to obey. I was going to prove myself. A loyal follower, a true disciple. That's how I'd always lived my life, in my strength. I would prove how devoted I was to him. How could I have known? How but I should have known. He even told me exactly how it would happen. But when he told me that I would deny him three times before the rooster crows, it was as if my mind couldn't even process the information. How could I deny him? I could not deny him. I would not deny him. Later that night, when we, after we'd eaten the Passover together, he said he wanted to go to the garden to pray. He also said he did not want to be alone. So several of us went with him. We didn't know what was going on, but we could sense even in the air that something was different. Even the dim moonlight, it was clear. He was in pain. 
He wasn't afraid. In fact, you know, I don't think I ever saw him truly afraid. Not the way I've been afraid. But he was in pain. He was in the middle of some agonizing struggle. He left the three of us, James and John and myself, alone, and he went a little further off. We couldn't see him as well, but we could hear him praying. Sometimes he prayed with words. Sometimes he prayed with groans. Such agonizing groans. We just stood there for nearly an hour, not knowing what to do. Nobody spoke, but we could all feel that something was not quite right. Keep watch, he said. And so I would. I would keep watch for my master. I would be a strong tower for him in his hour of need. But I was so tired. If only I could just sit down for a few moments. I could still keep watch while sitting. If only I hadn't eaten so much at dinner. Maybe I could just stretch out and close my eyes. I could still listen, maybe even better with my eyes closed, I thought. Simon, are you sleeping? Couldn't you stay awake for even an hour? His words jolted me awake. I groped about for my sword, mumbling something about closing my eyes to concentrate better. But he knew better. Even in that moment, he knew. My master always knew. He knew. And as I think about it now, the disappointment I saw in his eyes, the sorrow, was as much for me as it was for him. For he knew what I was about to face. He knew how hard I was about to fall. I think it made him deeply sad. But do you know, he loved me too much not to let me go through with it. He loved me too much not to let it happen to me. My confidence in me, my self-sufficiency, and my pride would have to die. And it would be a pain-filled death. Yet even there in the garden, even in that moment, he shared that pain with me. When they finally came for him in the garden, it was probably not how you think of it. In, you know about his betrayal, how Judas, one of us, betrayed him with a kiss, and how he slunk away into the darkness. And that was the last time I ever saw Judas alive. But in the, in the moments before the chaos of the arrest, there was a period of time where nobody spoke. Nobody even moved. And in fact, as I think about it now, I could see fear in their eyes. In the eyes of the, the temple guards and the chief priests. They were afraid. It was as if their eyes were saying that they knew they had no business being there and that he could do with them whatever he wished. It was the master who first broke the silent standoff when he said, whom do you seek? After he said that, they moved quickly to arrest him with chains and with clubs. You probably also heard about my pitiful attempt as a bumbling swordsman and how he rebuked me for it. How he turned to me and said, put away your sword, Peter. For everyone who lives by that sword will die by it. And then he said, don't you know that even now I could call a legion of angels and they would come to my defense? But then how would the scripture be fulfilled? He said, am I not to drink the cup the Father has laid before me? I don't think I understood what he meant then. His words stung me. My best efforts to defend him were not only not good enough, I felt as if they weren't even wanted. The next few hours of my life are forever etched in my memory, every agonizing detail. We scattered and fled as they arrested him and took him away. Some of us followed at a distance, watching from the shadows as they led him through the dark city streets. I kept my distance, but I stayed close enough to see where they were taking him. I won't tell you of that sham they called a trial. No doubt you already know about that. If you don't, you can read about it in detail in what many of the brothers have already written. But I will tell you about my trial that night, how miserably I failed. When they reached the home of Caiaphas, the high priest, they went into the inner courtyard, and from where I was, outside the wall, I could no longer see or hear what was going on. I strained my eyes, but I was so scared to move. I heard a voice coming out of the darkness saying, Simon, Simon, is that you? It was John. He motioned for me to follow him, and we crossed the street together. But I hesitated while he crossed and went inside the courtyard. I was so scared. As I approached nervously the, the girl at the gate, she nodded and smiled at me. 
I tried not to make eye contact, and as I passed, she looked at me and said innocently enough, aren't you one of them? Weren't you with the Galilean? Before I could even think, I said, I don't know what you're talking about, woman. As I, as I passed by her, I thought to myself, had I really just denied Jesus? Had I really just said I didn't know him? I tried to convince myself that that was a necessary denial, you see, so that I could stay close to him. Isn't that what our flesh does? Rationalizes, explains away, denies, always tries to find an excuse for its failure. But there was no rationalization for the pit that was growing in my stomach. There was no rationalization for what I felt I stood shivering in the corner, shivering even as sweat of nervousness trickled down the back of my neck. Several of the servants of the high priest's house started to make a fire in the courtyard. And as I moved to get closer to it to warm myself, I bumped into one of the servant girls. It was the same girl from the gate. She looked at me suspiciously this time, and she went over to one of the temple guards and whispered to him. And then he turned and said, you were with him, you were with the Galilean. I was so nervous, I began to panic. And again, before thinking, I shouted out, I don't know what you're talking about, don't be ridiculous, I don't know him. It was pretty obvious that my loud denials weren't convincing anybody. But the guard just shrugged and shook his head and for some reason let the matter drop. Through the crowd, I saw John in a distance and I tried to make my way to him. And as I did, I bumped into somebody and I felt somebody poking me in the back. Turning around, I saw a finger wagging in my face and a man accusing loudly, I know you were with the Galilean. I tried to be casual about it. Don't be ridiculous. I don't know what you're talking about. But then he turned to the crowd and he shouted, this man is lying. I know he was with him. Even his Galilean accent gives him away. I don't know how to explain to you what happened next, except to tell you that from somewhere deep inside of me, there came an eruption of anger of violence and of obscenity that shocked everyone who heard it, especially me. I shouted, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know that man and I've never known him. I started to tremble and I shouted even louder. He's no friend of mine and I have nothing to do with him. Everyone was looking at me now and I pointed right at Jesus and I said, I don't care what happens to him. I didn't realize how loud I was shouting until the silence that followed. I was still pointing at Jesus. I turned to look at him, and he was looking straight at me. He wasn't angry. He wasn't even disappointed, but he was sad. And when our eyes met, I knew there was no hiding place for me left on this earth. You can't hide from yourself. I think what I saw in his eyes, as I think back on it now, was that he saw in me that I was face to face with the dark truth of who I really was. I began to weep. Sobs began to rise up in my throat and I couldn't stop them. I began to sob and cry and it was choking me. I felt as if I couldn't breathe. It was as if the shame of what I had just done was choking me and I ran from the courtyard, sobbing as I ran. I ran out in the streets in the darkness. I ran until I couldn't run anymore. And I sat down on some deserted street, full of filth and stench, it seemed to me at that moment, a fitting place to live out the remainder of my days. And I sat there all night. You see, what happened that night to me was not just a failure, it was a death. It was the death of me, the death of Simon, the death of the great guardian of the king, so much for the leader of men, so much for the master's champion. It wasn't just a failure. And if you, have, if you know him, then you've come to this realization about yourself too. Failure I knew how to deal with. Failure was just a call to try harder. This was something else entirely. This was as if the very foundation of my life had just crumbled beneath me. This was the death of everything that I thought I was. I felt the flood of tears well up again within me and I couldn't stop. That night, 
that terrible night was both the worst night and the best night of my life. How can it be the best night of my life, you ask? That's what I want to tell you about. It's because of what he did for me after his crucifixion, after his resurrection. You see, after the events, the devastating news of his crucifixion, we were all lost, aimless. But news began to spread about his resurrection, about the empty tomb. I had seen the empty tomb. None of us knew quite what it meant, but the word was spreading that he was indeed alive. I can't describe to you my joy when I heard that news, how overwhelming it was. Yet at the same time, in the back of my mind, I, there was this doubt, this shame, this insecurity, thinking, what about me? Does he have a place left for me? If it's true, would he ever call me Peter, the rock, again? No, of course not. Surely I had no more right or claim to that title. So I live with both this anxious joy and this terrible fear. You see, I was soon to discover that his declaration of me as the rock was never and will never be based on anything in me, but on him and what he was going to do in me and through me. It happened this way. We were back in Galilee, and I had decided to go back to the only thing that I knew, fishing. I would convinced the others to join me. It was early in the morning. We'd been out all night. We were fishing. I think it was James who saw him first a lone figure on the shore, waving to us. We couldn't see who it was exactly. It was too far away, but we could hear his voice. You know, sound travels over the water. The voice called out to us, calling us, Children, haven't you any fish? Honestly, I thought it was just a, a customer early in the morning hoping for fresh fish. I did think it was a little strange that he called us children. And then the voice called out to us again and said, Try casting your nets on the other side. Nobody spoke. But as soon as the voice said that, we all knew instantly who it was. We'd heard that before, you see. I sprang to the nets, and with a mighty heave, I threw him out into the sea. And what followed was exactly what we'd seen before, the first time we met him. So many fish. You won't believe me, but fish were actually swimming into our nets, trying to get in the nets, threatening to sink the boat. I was overwhelmed, but it wasn't the fish. It was him. I was so excited. We began to make our way to shore as fast as we could. I could hardly stand it. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever had earthly riches, what you used to think you really want in life, right in your grasp, and to realize that it's nothing if you don't have him? Have you ever felt like all that you thought you had to have pales in comparison to having him? I didn't want fish. I just wanted Jesus. As soon as we were close enough, I leapt over the side of the boat and began to splash my way to shore. I didn't know what I was gonna, thought I was going to say to him. I wasn't really thinking at all. When I got to him, I was just standing there huffing and dripping right in front of him. He didn't speak a word, but he smiled at me. At me. That same smile I'd seen so many times before. That same wonderful, knowing smile that I thought would never be directed at me before. You know, I want so much for you to know what it was like that morning on the beach. I noticed behind him that he built a fire of coals. And in a few moments, we were eating breakfast together, a fresh fish on the beach. All of my best friends in the world, laughing, talking. But most of all, it was just him. Just being there with him. It was so good, almost painfully good. Yet... Even in the back of my mind, there was this lingering doubt and fear. What about me? What about me? After we finished eating, he motioned for me and asked me to come for a walk with him. We walked along the beach, and when we were a few feet away from the rest, he was gazing out on the Sea of Galilee, and he turned to me and he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he gestured toward the boat and the nets. I smiled to myself because I thought, he knows the answer to this. I said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. We walked a few paces more, and he asked me again, Simon, do you truly love me? 
At first, it, I thought he doubted me, but then I knew in his heart, he knew the answer. And I said, Lord, you know that I love you. Only a few moments passed, and he asked me a third time. And I will confess that at that, when he asked me the third time, for a moment I despaired, thinking, does he question me? Does he doubt it's true? And then I realized what he was doing. I looked beyond him and I saw the fire. And I remembered the fire in the high priest's courtyard. And I remembered my three denials. And I thought of my Lord's three questions. You know, every time he asked me, do you love me? He gave me a command. He said, feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. And so that final time I said, Lord, you know all things. And you know, as best I can, I love you. And he said, take care of my, fee, my sheep. Feed my flock. That's why I carry this. As a reminder, that though I was a fisherman, I have a great shepherd. And he gave me a new name and a new role. You see, that moment on the beach, what Jesus was doing for me was to remove the great shame and fear of my life. And he can do that for you too if he hasn't already. The greatest shame of your life, the thing you, you, you think would be your undoing if anyone knew, the thing you think is your darkest, the darkest truth about you, that's what he took away from me on the beach and eliminated completely. He removed it. He healed it. He forgave it. Tears began to well up in my eyes after, he, after that dawned on me. But they were not tears of shame this time or fear. They were tears of love because he had restored me. This was my resurrection. He'd had his. This was mine. The death I died that night, I betrayed him. It was the death of Simon. This was my resurrection, the resurrection of Peter. I knew in that moment myself to be who he had called me. I knew that it was true all along. And he had known my true identity all along, even when I hadn't, even when I'd run from it even when I had doubted it. What he was doing for me was to destroy my false foundation of self-reliance. Remember I said, that's how I'd always live my life, depending on me? He took that away and he gave me the only true foundation there is, him. He's the true rock. As I said, I'm really only a pebble. He was building my life, rebuilding it on him, the one true and solid foundation. If you ask me if I value the days that I spent with him on this earth, I would tell you more than life itself. But if you ask me if I would trade what I have now for who I was then, I would tell you not for anything. Not for anything. You see, every one of us builds our life on something we hope to be unshakable, unbreakable, solid. We rarely think about it, but every decision we make, every word we speak, it's built on whatever this foundation is. And it took me until that moment on the beach to realize there's only one true, solid foundation. Before our time together on the beach had ended, Jesus said one other thing to me, which at the time I had no idea what he was talking about, but that wasn't unusual for many of us. He said, Simon, when you're older, you will stretch out your hands and someone will take you where you do not want to go. I didn't know what he was talking about. Now I know. He was talking about my death, which is not far off, and how it would bring him glory, the way that I would die. I could hear them coming. They're coming for me. I did not think they would come quite so soon. As I said, I don't have much time left. When they arrested me, they told me that I would die in the same fashion as my master on a cross. You probably think that might scare me. But I've also been told that they've granted my last request. That my cross would not stand upright as his did, but upside down. So that no one would ever confuse me with my master, with my shepherd, with my king. If you think of me at all after I've left this body, do not credit to me any of the things my Lord chose to do through me or in me. As I said, I'm not unique. There's nothing special about me. If there's any difference in me from any other, it's that he loved me. Do you know as I think about it, 
Jesus really only did one thing for me from which everything else flowed. Do you know what that is? He loved me. And if I'm unique at all, it's only because I chose to receive the love that he offered. And I urge you to do the same. For it's the same love for you. He does not love me any more than he loves you. For perfect love knows no degree. My dear friends, do not grow weary or impatient in your faith. For the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises to you as some people think of slowness. He is patient with you. He doesn't want any of you to perish, but all of you to come to repentance and to know the depth of his love. My friends, humble yourselves therefore before God under his mighty hand and cast all of your cares upon him, for he cares for you.